Good afternoon. In my opinion, we're all suffering from PTSD. We went through an event that was the kind of the biggest kind of event for many, many of us for our lifetime. You know, the death of the United States is probably approaching a million and a half people. You know, it's something that's just hard to digest. But we need to digest because we need to figure out what can we learn from this. And I will try to, and one major lesson came to me, which changed the way I look at the world, is a trade-off between efficiency and resilience. So when you look at COVID-19, we, we think of it as a, as a pandemic. So typically we think of it as public health crisis, and you may remember the dashboard and all the things that we've been obsessively looking at morning, noon, and, and evening. But it was not only a, a public health crisis. It was an economic crisis. I mean, millions of people lost their jobs. Here is in, in, in a November, just after things, before, after, just before I think Thanksgiving, 26 million people don't have enough food. Think about it, 26 million people don't have enough food. This is not a parking lot at Disneyland. These are people waiting to pick up food at the food bank. It was a social crisis, Black Lives Movement. And it was a political crisis, the January 6th insurrection. All of these were somehow all entangled together. And when you look, but all of course, all of this was, was, was triggered by the COVID virus. It started with the pandemic. And you ask yourself, did we, how come we were not ready? So there is a book, The Viral Storm, The Pandemic, The Dawn of the New Pandemic Age by Nathan Wolf. And if I, if, if I saw it and I had to guess when was it written, I would think, okay, maybe 2021, 2022. No, this was 2011. People have been warning a pandemic is coming. It's a globalized world, living closer to, 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 to animals. There are all kinds of reasons why people say the pandemic is coming. But we didn't pay attention. Now let me remind you of the early days, March 2020, when people start talking about flattening the curve. Here is a chart, how do people say we have to flatten the curve. Why flatten the curve? Well, this is the argument that we are going to have the infection, we have nothing really to stop it, but we can slow it down. And why should we slow it down? Because hospitals were collapsing under the pressure. Not so much so in Houston, but if you look at like the Northeast, in New York City, hospital, Italy, you may remember, hospitals were not able to cope with the load of, of uh, cases. Article uh, from, from April 2020 from Market Watch, nurses are wearing garbage bags as the battle coronavirus. It's something out of the twilight zone. Why? Not enough PPEs, protective personal equipment. And that unreadiness uh, inspired William Galston, an economist who writes for the Wall Street Journal, and he wrote a column that caught my, my, my attention, efficiency, ver resilience versus efficiency. And he wrote efficiency isn't only economic virtue. What if the relentless pursuit of efficiency, which has dominated American business thinking for decades, has made the global economic system more vulnerable to shocks? He explained that, that efficiency means optimal adaptation to, to a particular environment. You, can, you are leveraging it in an optimal way. Resilience means that you are capable of adapting to disruptive changes. The de diction definition of resilience, ability to recover readily from illness, depression, adversity, or the like. So I'll give you an example of efficiency versus resilience. I, I still remember where Compact, Compact was a big company here in town making PCs, and, and Dell was a big company in, in, uh, in Austin making PCs. What was their claim to fame? Efficient manufacturing, just-in-time manufacturing. What was just-in-time manufacturing? Well, having a warehouse full of parts is actually very expensive to build a warehouse put stuff in the warehouse, get stuff out of the warehouse. While stuff is in the warehouse, it doesn't make any money. So can we eliminate the warehouse? If we are just smart enough, parts will go straight to the manufacturing line. We can eliminate completely the warehouse. This is called just-in-time manufacturing. And if you do it well, you're highly efficient, you reduce your cost significantly, but you assume best-case logistics. What happens if, for example, take a an unlikely scenario, a, sh a boat gets stuck in the Suez Canal. Who would have thought about that? And then the whole world supply chain grinds to a halt because of one boat stuck in the, in the Suez Canal. 
So efficiency comes at the expense of resilience. And we now remember the, 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 this, this uh, twilight zone days where we didn't have enough toilet paper. We couldn't buy enough toilet paper. Here's a picture I took at Costco of the paper products at Costco. You can see empty shelves. What's the journal? Why are there not enough paper towels? Blame lean manufacturing. It's another term for just in time. A decade long effort to eke out more profit by keeping inventory low left many manufacturers unprepared when COVID strike and production is unlikely to ramp up significantly anytime soon. Well, by now we have enough toilet paper, but we, again, issue was just in time manufacturing. And even hospital, why did COVID overwhelm hospitals? Again, Wall Street Journal. Why did COVID overwhelm hospitals? A years long drive for efficiency. Health system have kept a tight train on employee numbers and expanded outpatient care, helping their finances, but making them less prepared for medical crisis. Again, efficiency versus resilience. So it's interesting to step outside of the COVID-19 and see there is someone who has been thinking about it for a long time. It's called nature. And so in, in 2016, this is a magazine I was an editor in chief, we published an article, Sex is an Algorithm, The Theory of Evolution Under the Lens of Computation. It was a very serious article. It's a scientific article. Apparently, the pink color offended some people, and maybe the, the big word sex. So let me say what it was. It was really a very serious argument. The article was by Adil Ivnat and Crystal Papadimitriou. And asked the following question. If you look at nature, there are two different uh, 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 reproductive mechanisms. One, which is bacteria do, and, and uh, evolve, evolution, they, and they evolve by mutation. And then, however, most uh, uh, animals use sexual reproduction. So computer scientists have tried to learn from this to, to find optimization algorithm. And one is called simulated annealing, which is you try to improve something by a sequence of small steps, improvement, local improvement, small mutation. And there is something called genetic algorithm, which you do this improvement, but also you take two different things and you crossbreed them to get the best, of, the best of both. And these are called genetic algorithms. And they mimic, again, reproduction by mutation and reproduction via sex. Our computational experience have shown us that Mutations as a search mechanism, optimization mechanism, is much better than crossbreeding. So bacteria may not have as much fun, but actually they do very well. They evolve much better than us. And so the question is, why does nature diet in, in, does it in such a way? Why does nature prefer for animals, usually their preference is sexual reproduction, rather than reproduction by just, uh, by, by, by uh, you know, the cell split into two? And the answer is, I did leave not in public you gave an answer. And he said, if you are focused just on efficiency, then indeed mutations are better. What sexual reproduction offers is genetic diversity. Why is genetic diversity important? Because suddenly environment change. There's suddenly global warming or global cooling that we've had in the past. And a species that has more genetic diversity, some, of, some organism will not survive, but there's enough diversity that some will survive, and the species will survive. And nature wants the species to survive. Individual organisms can be sacrificed. The species wants to survive. So another way to think about it is efficiency is short-term optimization, while resilience is long-term optimization. How do we ensure that you are still going to be here in a thousand years? And short-term optimization, you know, you may be a very efficient hunter, but the climate changes, suddenly it's cold, you don't survive. The rats survived, the dinosaurs did not. And in fact, in fact, Darwin said, it is not the strongest of the species that survive, not the most intelligent. It is the one that is most adaptable to change. And that is, again, resilience. So now I want to go back and look at ourselves. First, I look at, at computer science. So the art of com computer programming by Don Knuth is the closest we have in computer science to a Bible. And it's all about the, what's called the analysis of algorithm. Now, what is the analysis of algorithm? It's about when you run an algorithm, how much time does it take? How much memory does it take? It's all about efficiency. So there are 
by the several volume of this book, this is life project, it's all about efficiency. So let's take one look at an algorithm that is very efficient. It's a famous algorithm, it's called the PageRank. And the algorithm that Google deployed in the late 90s to when you run a web search, how to sort the result. You may remember, if you're old enough, you remember the, the other search engine. And you had to go screen after screen after screen to find something good. You use Google and you go, pam, pam, everything was good. How did Google do it? They, says they had the following idea. If many websites point to you, you must be an important website. If many important websites point to you, you must be a very important website. And if, if many very important websites point to you, you're a very, very important website, and so on and so forth. And this algorithm worked like a charm. And it really gave us, you look, usually, you even though I got lucky. You look at one, you, you, you get one result, and it's usually the good result. However, clever people realize, if I open, I decide to open an Israeli restaurant now in Houston, and I want it to float up to the top of ranking, what will I do? I'll create lots of fake websites and have them all point at my restaurant. And this is a whole business. It's called search engine optimization. How to make your, your website float to the top of the result. And uh, so it turned out that PageRank was not resilient. It was very efficient, but it was not resilient. And in fact, after a while, Google decided to, to drop it. And in fact, now, if you ask them, how do you search your result, they tell you it's a straight secret. Because they don't want to reveal it, because as soon as they reveal it, people will try to optimize against it. Okay? So again, Google has sacrificed efficiency in the name of resilience. Um, here is something I pointed about a decade ago. I started my eyes start opening to the fact that computing is, is not always a blessing to humanity. And I wrote in, in, in a magazine, our discipline is dedicated to reducing friction. Latency must be eliminated. Bandwidth must increase. Ubiquity should be universal. Our goal is to reduce the friction of computing and communication as much as possible. In fact, you go and you look at, at how Mark Zuckerberg described Facebook in the early days, call it frictionless sharing. Now we realize the frictionless sharing is actually a very bad idea. Okay? Many of the, of the bad stuff that happen, happens on, on social media, filter bubble, fake news, extreme content, misinformation, disinformation, partly it's a result because it's just too easy to share. You know how I know it's too easy to share? Because I share too much. Too easy to share. And you see it in other areas. For example, 2010, there was an event that has become known in the, in the investing community as the flash crash. The Dow Jones Industrial Average dropped 600 points in five minutes. Okay, they have to stop trading. It was the worry was it will just, the, the market will collapse. And then they did analysis, what happened? What happened is high frequency trading. So they discovered that you get an advantage by trading just a bit faster than your competitors, and even a bit faster. So suddenly it became, you know, I should have, I could have, it would be cheaper to have the trading operation in New Jersey, but then the signal has to go from New Jersey all the way to Wall Street, and that you spend a few microseconds doing it. So you better find it very close, okay? You want to save microseconds. But if everybody is acting very fast, the interaction can be very unpredictable, and that's what led led to the, to the crash. Now, proponents of high frequency trading say it makes the market more liquid. There is always a propaganda why this is good. But one of the people who initiated it actually says, today's drive for speed has absolutely no social value. And economists have studied it, wrote, high frequency trading arm race is a symptom of flawed market design, wrong incentive. We got efficiency at the expense of resilience. And so, Imagine I go to my colleague across the, across the quad, mechanical engineers, and tell them, you know, in computer science, we think friction is bad. We, we want to eliminate all friction. You should do the same. Eliminate all friction. They will say, are you nuts? Friction is very important. In the right place at the right time. Eliminate all friction, the world cannot survive if we eliminate all friction. In the drive shaft, yes. On the wheels, imagine if the wheels have no friction between the wheel and the road. So. Computer science has yet to learn how to welcome friction in the right place at the right time. Now, I want to talk about economics. So, why were we not ready for the pandemic? 
The answer is actually very obvious, because it costs money to be ready for a pandemic. Of course, as we have learned, it costs way, 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 way more money not to be ready for a pandemic. But, you know, it's, it's you know, February 2020, Trump had to defend why he cut the, the CDC budget. He says, well, when we need doctors, we will hire them. Of course, when you really need them, it's too late. And in fact, it's hard to believe, but in 2019, just before the pandemic, the Trump administration shut down the CDC Vaccine Safety Office. Who needs them? Let's save money. But you can't just blame it all on Trump. Economic efficiency is a mantra in the business and economics disciplines. What is economic efficiency? So I went and, and, and looked at Investopedia. So Investopedia tells us that economic efficiency means that goods and factor of production are distributed or allocated to the most valuable users and waste is minimized. Furthermore, free market advocates argue that through individual self-interest and freedom of production as well as consumption, economic efficiency is achieved and the best interests of society as a whole are fulfilled. Magic, the free market will do everything, efficient and optimality. Is this the case? So uh, in 2008, in 2010, after the, there was a financial crisis of 2008, I went on sabbatical at Hebrew University, and I was very shaken by the almost collapse of the economy, and I went to some top-notch economists and I said, tell me, what is the theorem that says that Capitalism is better than communism. We know that communism sucks, but tell me, what is the theorem that capitalism is better? They say, go read the welfare theorem. So I went and read the first welfare theorem, and it's essentially said under certain technical assumptions, a free market will tend towards a co competitive Pareto optimal equilibrium. And I won't go into precise definition, but it means it is efficient. But it doesn't say, does it guarantee the best interests of society? Does this efficiently guarantee the best interests of society? And that question actually was, was addressed by, in 1991, by computer scientists. Uh, Dimitris Kutsupias and Christopher Bademitriou, Sempa Bademitriou. And they said, look, there could be many equilibria. And the theorem doesn't tell us which equilibrium we're going to end up at. So let's take the best equilibrium in terms of the societal utility and the worst equilibrium and see what could be the relation, the ratio between them. And they show that the ratio can be very, very high. So depending on the vagaries of the market, we could end up in a very bad equilibrium as opposed to a very good equilibrium. So economic efficiency does not guarantee the best end of society as a whole are fulfilled. This is myth, it's propaganda, it's not science. And a beautiful example that we have also learned now over the last few years is the whole concept of free trade. So you go back to David Ricardo, early, 18, early 19th century. The idea is that uh, if England is better in making, in making wool and Greece is better in making olive oil, they should all focus on their core competence and trade with each other. That would be more efficient. Okay, that's very good. But then, for example, Europe decided that Russia is better in at, uh, at uh, you know, with natural gas and then somewhere else. It is more efficient to buy natural gas from Russia. And now they're stuck, you know, they can't just say, okay, no more gas from Russia. They're trying to support Ukraine while still buying gas from Russia. Blumberg in, in last year, January last year, Europe sleepwalked into energy crisis that could last years. And right now we look at the, the, the capacity of the world, the semiconductor capacity of the world, it is situated in one of the most geopolitically tense places in the world, Taiwan. If you want to know why we're fighting, why we're supporting so much, so much Russia, because we're worried about what will happen in Taiwan. So free trade is efficient, but it is not resilient. Now we can go back to COVID, ask ourselves, what did work in COVID? And here computer scientists can be proud, the internet saved the world. If you may remember, in, on, in, in the second week of March, we were told, spring break, don't come home. When you come back, we're going to teach, when you, the semester resume, we're going to teach online. Poof, just like that, we're able to teach online. And we're able to work from home, shop from home, teach from home, learn from home, see doctors from home. The internet worked. It did not suddenly a huge demand on internet. Internet held. What is the key design of the internet? The internet was designed originally by the military to survive a nuclear war. 
And the key, how do you survive a nuclear war? Redundancy. And it, the idea of redundancy, I, I think I trace it first back, but I'm happy to run otherwise, to the concept of error correcting codes in 1947. For Norman asked the question about bi biology. Every individual cell is not reliable. But we are actually pretty reliable. Redundancy. And in fact, now we understand, even for if you look at banks, after the 2008 financial crisis, what do banks need to have? Extra capital, redundancy of capital. It's the same thing. But redundancy is not efficient. It sits there and does nothing. But it gives you resilience. So I hope the message is that resilience is a fundamental but underappreciated societal need. To survive, we need resilience. And it means that many of us need to rethink. I think my discipline needs to do it. Economy needs to do it. Increase focus on, on resilience. And this is how to focus on resilience. So here in, in Texas, I have to renew my car registration every year. And when you do that, you have to show, you go to do a car inspection, you have to show them proof of insurance. Why, why do they care? They just do car inspection. They report to the state. The state wants to make sure that you are insured. Because insurance is a mechanism for resilience. And most people say, well, I'm a careful driver. It won't happen to me. And so we are being forced. There is societal action that forces us to be resilient. And we need to apply it to a bigger, bigger, to other, you know, bigger scale to society. I'll finish with a quote due to Wired magazine from the fallen Champlain Tower, the tower that collapsed in Florida, killing about 100 people to climate change. Humans haven't yet learned to avoid catastrophe they know are coming. Of course, climate change is the poster child for a catastrophe that we know is coming. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? In the back. Great. Um, thanks for having me. Thanks for coming out on a Tuesday afternoon. I know it's a busy time of the semester. Um, so I'm going to talk about resilience through a little bit of a different perspective. Um, I did not design the promotional materials for, for this year's uh, seminar series, but I could not have picked a better metaphor for resilience than a plant that's thriving in an improbable, harsh environment. Uh, I'm going to take that metaphor and run with it a little literally, so I'm actually going to be talking about plants. And I'll start with the idea that I want to eventually leave you with, that yes, this plant is thriving in a harsh, improbable place, but it had help. And the help is the, the um, mutualism mechanism that I'll talk about as a source of resilience. Uh, before I get to that, like this plant, I have help, <laughs> and I want to acknowledge the many wonderful folks in our lab community who contribute ideas and data and results that I'm going to be sharing today. Uh, I also want to acknowledge uh, funding for this work. I also want to acknowledge um, where we do this work, and so these, the stars on this map indicate the places across the country where we have active field research. and. Overlaid onto that is the uh, indigenous history of that land. So we, we want to acknowledge that the lands that we work at, including where we're sitting, is stolen land. And that history precedes and in some ways facilitates a lot of the work that we do. So we think it's important to acknowledge that. And we're grateful for the opportunity to, to go and work at these places. OK, so I'm an ecologist, and I'm going to be talking about resilience through the lens of ecology. So what do I mean by ecology? It's the scientific study of distribution and abundance. So where and, and at what abundance do we observe plant and animals across nature? And you can think about that, for example, with Texas blue bonnets. So why are they only distributed in Texas? What controls why some years are big blue bonnet years and others are not? But maybe you don't care about blue bonnets. You probably care about infectious diseases. So why are mosquitoes distributed the way that they are? And how are they distributing uh, infectious emerging tropical diseases? Uh, point being that ecology is the foundation with which we can both understand the patterns that we see in nature, but it also provides a way of addressing problems that affect human livelihood and well-being. So when we talk about ecological resilience, we're thinking about the resilience of distribution and abundance against perturbations and stressors in the environment. And we live in a time of perturbation and stress in the environment, um, much of that driven by anthropogenic activity and picking right up from, from Moshe. Leading among those is climate change. And this is a really compelling data visualization of 200 years of climate change, where each stripe is a year and the color indicates temperature. So as we all know, we're on a rapidly warming planet. And so there's a need to understand what are the implications of this abrupt and rapid environmental change for the world around us that supports human life. 
but climate change is more than just about warming. Climate change is also about variability in the environment. And so to illustrate that, I, I went back and sort of reconstructed uh, the, every September that I've lived in Texas since 2011. And those of you who have lived here a while probably have lived experiences with, with some of these events. So the September 2011 was this epic once in a generation or, or more um, intense drought, rivaled only actually by the, the recent drought of 2023. And then you have years like 2017 that look like a good year. I'm mapping drought intensity here. Um, so this looks like a good year, but actually it's just a catastrophe of a different sort because that was Hurricane Harvey, right? So the environment flips back and forth and climate scientists forecast that these whiplash events are gonna be increasing in frequency under global change. So again, there's a need to understand how these regimes of variability are gonna be reshaping ecological systems. But ecology is more than just about climate. Ecologists also think a lot about the interactions between species, the biotic element of the environment. And historically, perspectives on species interactions have really focused on antagonistic interactions, the charismatic, bloody interactions between predator and prey. So nature red in tooth and claw, as, as Tennyson wrote, and sort of represented in uh, this Rousseau painting, The Repast of the Lion, that centers this bloody scene of, of a predator and its prey. And all this is true. There are predators and parasites and competitors in the environment. It, it's, it's rough out there. But it's also the case that if you shift focus a little bit, and if we maybe look at this painting through a different lens, the, the colors that are used for contrast here, these are flowers that plants use to attract partners. So beneficial interactions, in this case between plants and animals that might pollinate them, beneficial interactions are actually really common in nature the more that we look. So through a different artistic lens, this scene could have been the repast of the hummingbird that might feast on the nectar being offered in exchange for pollination services, for example. So plants in particular rely heavily on partners, on, on mutualists. And so we can go back to our plant growing in the sidewalk to sort of think through how mutualism might have conferred this plant's apparent resilience. So how did it get to that crack in the sidewalk? It was probably pooped by an animal that might have transported it from, from somewhere. As a seedling grows, it likely is going to recruit fungal partners that colonize roots and enhance surface area for nutrient and water uptake. As the plant grows, it would likely need to recruit defenders, ant defenders, or microbes that provide uh, defense to the foliage against natural enemies. And when the plant is ready to reproduce, it is going to need to recruit animal partners to move its pollen around. So, in all of these cases, um, this is mutualism, but it's not altruism. So the, the bees don't want to just help the plants, right? So these are exchanges of goods or services. And part of why the study of mutualism is, is so interesting, I think, is the, the lability of, of what you pay and what you get. Um, in some cases, you could pay more than you get, and that might tip the interaction towards antagonism. So we study the interactions between plants and the, the partners, the, the animals and, and microbes with which they engage in their environment. And we do so against this backdrop of, of rapid change in our, in our environment to try to understand the extent to which these positive species interactions confer resilience. And we work in a particular um, kind of lab rat system that is uh, actually grasses. So I sometimes lose people at grasses because it doesn't sound like the most exciting thing to study. But don't think about lawn grasses. Grasses are actually a hyper diverse plant family that are sort of ecological cornerstones in terrestrial biomes across the world. So grasses are really important and I'm a big proponent for, for why we should love and appreciate them. In addition to just being abundant, important, and, di and diverse, grasses also uh, harbor fascinating fungal symbionts. So this plant is not just one organism, it's actually a holobiont of a plant and a fungus that is shown in this ribbon of, of hyphae growing inside of plant tissues. So um, this is a specialized fungus that only lives inside of grasses and its growth and reproduction is intimately tied to its host. I'm gonna to refer to this as an endophyte, so endo inside fight plant. And so fungal endophytes are common symbionts of grasses, so they live in, you know, in coordination with their host. When the host goes to reproduce, the fungus will colonize the seeds that the plant makes. So in this image, you can see those ribbons of fungal hyphae that are colonizing the cells that become a plant embryo. This is vertical transmission, and this is how plants 
are essentially acquire their symbionts in the same way that humans have our core microbiomes, much of which is inherited from our, from our mothers. So plants do something similar, and this is generally considered a mutualism, where the plant is providing a safe place to live and, and, uh, and carbon resources that the fungus feeds on, and the fungi in return are great chemists and, conf and confer uh, chemical profiles uh, in the form of fungal alkaloids that help plants cope with stress. So it's a, it's a housing and reproduction for, for, for fungal alkaloid kind of exchange. But protection is great when you need it, but there are environments in which you may be paying for protection you don't need, and it's that kind of lability that we think a lot about. So our work relies on a few different kinds of approaches, and I'll, I'll show you a few examples of this. We, we're field experimental biologists, and so we do a lot of work that relies on a, a simple trick where we can take endophyte positive plants, so these are plants that harbor these fungi inside them. We can take the seeds of those plants, which also harbor these fungal endophytes, and if you heat treat seeds to a temperature that kills fungi but not plants, you can generate plants that are non-symbiotic, which I will call an E- minus or endophyte free, and contrast those with plants that are naturally endophyte symbiotic. And it's that contrast that informs what are the ecological consequences of this mutualism. So we do this in the lab, and then we pile plants into, into vans and drive them kind of all over the place and uh, plant them in the ground. And these, this kind of becomes the basis for field experiments, some of which I'll tell you about. In addition to, to our field experiments, we also work with biological collections. So we work with herbarium specimens, which are basically like plant museums where physical samples are stored. And because, the, because these are seed transmitted mutualists, we can recover seeds from herbarium samples, some of which might be hundreds of years old, and detect the presence or absence of fungal partners in those seeds as a way to reconstruct the past and understand how these interactions have changed as the environment has changed. And then lastly, we use statistical and mathematical modeling to build quantitative forecasts using the data that we generate. So I'll show you a few examples of how we use these approaches, and these will sort of exemplify this idea of climate resilience conferred by fungal mutualism. So I'm going to give you kind of two, two short stories. First, about climate resilience, um, specifically against drought. So we've done experiments where we plant experimental populations of grasses at varying initial frequencies of endophyte prevalence from populations with mostly E minus plants to populations with mostly E plus plants and everything in the middle. And we quantify how those populations change through time, which is what's plotted on the y-axis. If we take a treatment that creates a wet year at our Texas field sites, we get results like this that tell us that if we plant a 50-50 E plus E minus population and come back years later, it will still be about 50-50, which tells us that these endophytes are there, but they're actually neither costly nor beneficial. They just kind of float around, and there's no inherent advantage of hosting fungal partners. If we contrast that with treatments that create drought year conditions, then a 50-50 E plus E minus population would rise to 80 to 90 percent um, endophyte occurrence a couple years later. That's a signal of resilience. It tells us that endophyte positive plants fared better during these harsh conditions than endophyte negative plants. And we see the signature of that as the rise in prevalence of the interaction at the population level. This is what we see in populations that are side by side at our field sites. This got us thinking about how we know that drought conditions have been increasing in frequency through time under climate change. So would we see similar increases in the prevalence of this mutualism over the hundreds of years of anthropogenic climate change? So answering that question would require a time machine to go back and see how these interactions have changed, but luckily we have one because we work with these herbarium specimens, which are essentially time travel. What I mean by that is that every physical sample in an herbarium would be stamped with the location, in this example, from Clark County, Georgia, and the year. So this one in 1930. So we can map where specimens come from in geographic space, and we can map where they occur in time. And this is representing most of our sampling to date. So we've got most, much of the eastern uh, United States covered for a few different species that are represented in different colors here. And we have good coverage over a century of, of, um, of climate change. 
And one of the fun things about this type of work is, is the, the stories and, and characters that we encounter um, way, way back in the past. And so one of our oldest samples comes from 1851, and it was collected by Ferdinand Lindheimer, who is widely considered to be the father of Texas botany. He was a um, German political refugee and uh, migrated to Texas, started characterizing the plants here, and there's now over 40 plant species in Texas that, are, that bear his name in some way. So um, one day in 1851, uh, May 1st, 1851, it was a Thursday, I looked that up, um, he collected this plant. Um, it's an Elemis virginicus plant, and he affixed that plant to an herbarium sheet. Over the years, that, uh, and that happened in New Braunfels, Texas, and then over the years, that herbarium sheet found its way into the Bebb Herbarium at the University of Oklahoma. We visited that herbarium to collect seeds, brought those seeds back to our lab, and then on September 21st of last year, Mallory Tucker scored that plant to be endophyte negative. She did not find fungal endophytes in those seeds. So that's just a, a sort of a tangent to, to just make the point that I really like thinking about herbaria as this bridge between the past and the present. And I love the idea of, you know, dialogue between Ferdinand and Mallory via these physical samples that span centuries. So I digress a bit. Um, that's one sample, and of course we do this for many thousands of, of samples. What we find is that um, endophyte prevalence has consistently increased across the last 150 years of climate change. And that's shown here for three different species of grasses where the time is on the x-axis and then the incidence of these endophyte partners are on the y-axis. So to varying extents across species, um, fungal endophytes have increased in prevalence in ways that correspond to increasing climate stress over the last 150 years. We can further show, although I won't get into it here, that those increases have been strongest at the locations that have experienced the greatest climate change over the last couple, couple centuries. So this again is a, a larger temporal scale kind of illustration of the idea that fungal mutualism confers resilience to these plants because we, we can see that plants are turning more to fungal partners and we see the signature of that um, increasing as the environment has gotten more stressful. So the second example connects to this idea of variability as another element of climate stress and climate change. And this work relies on a long-term experiment that we initiated in 2007 using this, this same simple technology of heat treating seeds, generating endophyte positive and negative populations. I should say that they're not actually yellow. I'm using yellow just for visual contrast. Um, so, so we have populations that have been going for now 16 years. Um, and these have experienced natural birth death processes. We put these in the ground and let them do their thing. So they're recruiting, they're dying, they're living their plant lives. And we come every year and we see how they're doing. And to our knowledge, this is now the world's longest running field experiment on host symbiont interactions. And, and you know, we take some pride in that. So there's eight different host species. We've got over 16 years now and over 17,000 plants that, that are now part of this experiment. So it's, it's been a big labor of love. I'll show a couple of examples of what we learned from this and how that informs understanding of resilience against variability. In this example, I'm showing one host species, Poa alsodes, and its fitness over that time series for both endophyte positive, E plus, and endophyte negative, E minus populations. And there's two results here that I want to highlight. First is that on average, endophyte positive populations have higher fitness than endophyte negative. So on average, these, these partners confer an advantage um, that, that's lost when we remove them experimentally. It's also the case that endophyte positive populations experience lower fluctuations in their environment. So if you look at the range of variation in fitness across the y-axis, that's a narrower range for the endophyte positive populations. And so that's a form of buffering against climate variability. And you can see that most strongly in, you know, the worst year was 2012, where the E minus populations really tanked. But it was just sort of an, like a not so bad, bad year for the E plus populations. So in, in hard times, there's evidence that these fungal partnerships really kick in to rescue their host populations in ways that dampen the interannual fluctuations. So we, we wonder, because we know that increasing fluctuation is a dimension of climate change, we wanted to know to what extent is this dampening of fluctuation an important form of resilience for host plants in a future climate. 
So to do that, we can quantify the overall end of fight advantage, which is, is on the y-axis here, under different types of climate variability. And what I'm showing here is for that one species, under the ambient regime of climate variability, what we actually observed from 2007 to 2023, that there's you know, a quantifiable increase about a 10 to 15% fitness advantage for endophyte hosts in that case. But if we crank up variability in the environment, which we can do computationally by simulating future environments that are more variable in climate, the endophyte advantage doubles. And there's, so, so this is resilience against climate variability that kicks in as we ramp up fluctuations in climate. If we zoom out across many species in the experiment, we see that this is a consistent directional trend where under an increased pattern of climate variability, endophyte symbiosis confers stronger advantage. So that tells us that in future climates that we know are becoming more variable, this will be an important way in which host plants sort of um, re retain some resilience against that climate stressor. The, next, the last thing that I'll mention is what we're doing now. Um, so I've been talking about climate variability through time, but of course the climate also varies in space in ways that connect to the distribution part of ecology, the wear of ecology. So you can think about a species distribution as having some quasi-equilibrium with the climate in which that species occurs, such that there might be some sweet spot of climate suitability and where we expect where we expect the species to be distributed. So the nature of climate change is such that the way that climate maps onto geography is itself changing. So as that climate suitability moves in space, we're going to be left with species distributions that have these trailing edges where climate stress will be increasing. So whether or not that species distribution can sort of can be resilient against that stress depends on what happens at these trailing red range edges as the environment changes. So again, grasses and, and particularly grasses in Texas are a great way to study this. This was the map I showed you from our herbarium work and what you might have noticed is that all these species have westernmost range limits in the southern Great Plains, which makes Texas a really nice sort of laboratory with which we can study the resilience of species range limits under global change because the arid region, the arid environments that characterize the western parts of Texas are expected to creep eastward under global change. So what's going to happen to these, to these range edges? We're just getting that work started and it involves lots of travel. So we work across a climate gradient from the wet side of Texas and Louisiana, from Lafayette, Louisiana, out to Sonora, Texas. And we do our, you know, set up experiments that inform when and where are endophyte mutualists most beneficial and how might that confer resilience to these range edges under future climate environments. So we don't have those results to share yet, but maybe sometime um, the next time I'll be happy to, to tell you about what we find. So to summarize, um, I've told you that, you know, from a big picture perspective, mutualism is an important source of ecological resilience. And so that plant growing in the sidewalk had help. Um, and, you know, specifically in our case, we can demonstrate this through our work showing that plants rely on fungal mutualists to cope with climate stress. And that's true for the sort of average climate stress of increasing drought. It's also true for the increase in fluctuations in climate that we're anticipating. But I also want to emphasize that that source of resilience likely has limits. We don't know what those limits are, and I, and I think that's going to be an important direction for future work. But it's, I, I don't want to leave you with the impression that we don't need to worry about climate change because plants will just recruit partners that will keep them hanging on. That might be true to an extent, but, but there, there's limits to that. So we need to understand what those limits are. And then more generally, I'll just leave you with the idea that, you know, species interactions themselves can be important targets for conservation. We usually think about conservation as preserving species, but we're not trying to just preserve lists of species. It's the interactions between species that can promote resilience of ecological systems. So those themselves deserve sort of attention as targets of conservation. I'll leave it at that and I'm happy to, I guess, open the floor to uh, questions for both of us. Thank you.